Hi everyone, welcome to the 92nd virtual shadowing session. Tonight's session, we have a specialty spotlight in internal medicine with Dr. Richard Wynn. All right, next slide. Uh, please check the live chat box for links uh, for the session 92 quiz at the very end of the session, as well as an older session 16 link. Okay, next slide. Uh, for our upcoming sessions on March 15th, we have an emergency medicine resident. And then on March 22nd and March 29th, we're gonna take a break for spring break and then we'll get back uh, together on April 5th for a PA specialty spotlight in psychiatry. All right, next slide. Uh, just a friendly reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat as we go along. We will have two Q&A sessions <laughs> one in the uh, very middle and one at the very end of the presentation. And then here is our amazing virtual shadowing working group. Uh, next slide. All right, and then Dr. Fowler, do you have anything uh, before we start? Yeah, I do. Um, Adidia, can you mute everybody, please? Yes, sir. All right, we'll mute everybody. Uh, and do I? Okay, I'm here. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to have you. Uh, <laughs> yes, tardy grades. Yes. We're going to have a wonderful talk tonight. I am so excited. You're going to meet one of my best friends. This is Max Wynn. We'll introduce him in a second. Uh, Max and I have been on the admissions committee at UT Southwestern together for 10 years, and he is one of the sweetest, finest, smartest people that I've had the absolute pleasure to know. And uh, Max is not a clinician. Max is a scientist. And we're presenting tonight another route for you to consider that if you want to help people, there are many ways to help people. And we're going to get into that tonight. But especially we want you to know that uh, we're here for you. We're going to keep being here for you. We're filling out the camp calendar all the way through the end of May. We have a very exciting talk coming um, in a few weeks from now. Uh, that you'll enjoy almost as much as you enjoy this one. We have an anatomist who's an artist who's going to draw pictures for you online, live, uh, of cellular physiology for those of you who will be studying that in the very near future. So that's going to be an awful lot of fun. Anyway, on behalf of the whole working group and Dr. Wynn, we want you to know how very special it is for us that you come week in and week out. And as long as you keep coming, all 250 of you that are online and all the rest, we're gonna keep being here for you at virtual shadowing. So Elena, would you introduce our marvelous guest tonight? Uh, yes, Dr. Wynn, um, we are all very excited to hear your journey. So with that being said, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just need to know uh, which screen I'm on. Uh, do you see presenter slides or do you see the actual slide presentation? Uh, we see presenter. Yes. That should that, there you go. There you go. That, is that where we're at? Okay. Yes, sir. Looks marvelous. Okay, great. Uh, welcome. <clears throat> it's good to see you. I have heard uh, many, many uh, fine comments about uh, this program and um, about the virtual shadowing uh, world. I never <clears throat> imagined that I would be uh, a guest uh, host and a speaker on the program because I didn't uh, foresee that uh, you would want to hear from a, from a, uh, a lab rat, <clears throat> a guy that just stays and hangs out in the lab and uh, doesn't actually treat any patients. Most of my patients are four-legged patients uh, when I have patients. And so uh, it's a real pleasure to get to uh, join the group and to, uh, to present this evening. And so in some respects, this feels like my life's journey in science. Okay, I haven't been doing this quite as long as uh, Coach K at Duke has been coaching basketball at Duke, uh, but, but not too many years short of that. Okay, so just, just letting you know that, uh, that we, we are kind of in the same, uh, in the same class, uh, uh, as it were, um, but, um, but doing different things. So I didn't really know where to start. And I thought, well, perhaps I should just start with, with the beginning, uh, you know, and, and not, not this little kid that's down here playing with the red truck that looks like me. Uh, and that's not my dad either. Uh, but, but we uh, share many a feature uh, to, um, 
uh, to that picture. Uh, my father just passed away recently uh, at 92 and a half years of age. And uh, I just, you know, I uh, think uh, as a tribute to him, uh, giving me opportunities to do the things that I've enjoyed through my life, uh, that he enjoyed doing during his life is a remarkable thing. Uh, so I started hey, Max, out. Uh, yeah. Hey, Max, what, what did your daddy do? My dad, <clears throat> my dad was a, was a rancher and a farmer. And so I grew up where you see this, uh, you see this uh, green collared lizard. Uh, this is a, uh, the tail is longer than the body. And uh, they use the tail for counterbalance when they're running uh, through the plains. Uh, and this was out uh, just <clears throat> east of the New Mexico, Texas state line. And so I was actually fortunate that where I lived uh, was actually in Texas and not in New Mexico. Uh, but uh, that doesn't really matter, uh, except for the fact that I ended up uh, getting to interact with some of the uh, uh, fauna uh, out in uh, the wide open uh, Llano Estacado. Yes, right. So, um, and then beyond, okay? And so you, we'll talk about that as we go through the, the presentation this evening. And so I never had a specimen that looked quite like this. <clears throat> Either that or I never had a microscope that was as good a quality as this microscope is. But you can clearly see <clears throat> that these tardigrades have four pair of legs. They're mostly clawed, although not all tardigrades are, have clawed appendages. And they have a, a um, proboscis or a, uh, a central mouthpiece that they use for, for scarfing up uh, algae and lichens. Uh, they grow on lichens, they grow on moss, they, they grow uh, in these elements uh, where they can uh, ingest uh, those things uh, that uh, they can feed off of. We'll see a slide in, in just a minute uh, that kind of gives you some idea what they look like. They're, they're pretty transparent <clears throat> for the most part. And so when they've ingested food, uh, they, um, they look a little green, I guess you could say, at least some of them do. Uh, some of them actually have uh, appendages uh, that more are more like suckers instead of like claws. But I guess the claws for the ones that um, live on trees and on rocks make it easier for them to get around. Uh, some of them actually are red uh, in color. I mean, they're bright red like fire engines, and that's due to, to a group of compounds that are called carotenoids. And these carotenoids actually scarf up reactive oxygen species. And um, no one really knows uh, why uh, that's a particular uh, advantage uh, for a tardigrade to, to be red instead of uh, these other colored tardigrades, but nevertheless, that's, uh, that's the case. And then this bottom right uh, corner, you can see a tardigrade that's actually uh, desiccated. So tardigrades can go through periods where there's, when, when it's rained and, and there's a lot of water, then they're active and versus periods of time where uh, there's not much water around and they become desiccated. They have a compound in their body called treolose and it's actually a sugar and it's used to protect their enzymes. And it, it, that's actually a pretty high concentrations, essentially molar concentrations in their body to be able to, under conditions where they dry out, they really don't dry out. They just kind of uh, live in this desiccated uh, semi-dried state. And um, they can live like that for, well, we think long periods of time. Some people have said maybe as long as 100 years. We know that they've been in space. They've been uh, subjected to radiation. Their DNA is pretty tough. Um, and they uh, have made it back to Earth in uh, pretty amazing states, uh, even though they've been in uh, pretty, uh, pretty hostile environments. Uh, so I started out uh, my uh, undergraduate life as a, uh, I couldn't make a decision whether I was, I was talking to Dr. Fowler, he was asking me when I made a decision about what I wanted to do. And I said, from a very early age, I knew that I wanted to be a scientist. I uh, just liked uh, uh, taking things uh, apart, putting things back together. Uh, from biological standpoints. I uh, was big into uh, chemistry. I had a chemistry set and I blew up just about everything you could possibly blow up with the chemistry set. My mom got tired of buying me uh, test tubes. And so she said, that's it, you're done. 
And I had to find other means to uh, entertain myself by putting chemicals into, into things. Uh, but I couldn't decide what I wanted to do when I got to college. So I decided to, to, to major in both chemistry and biology. Okay. So I ended up with a double major in chemistry and biology and uh, uh, decided I wanted to go and um, become a biochemist because I'd taken a biochemistry course in my senior year of college. And that was probably the pivotal moment where I said, aha, this is really what I want to do. I want to be a, a, a nanomolecular mechanic. And um, I became, uh, I began the journey to become a biochemist. And so I went to uh, Texas Tech uh, and we were having some discussion earlier with some of the group uh, that have actually had uh, admission, uh, positive admission notices from Texas Tech that they're, uh, they're in school. So that's a fantastic thing. Uh, anytime I hear about the Red Raiders, uh, I have to, uh, I have to smile at that, yes. I uh, finished up my PhD, both a master's and PhD at Tech, and then I had a chance to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, Berkeley. So my wife and young daughter at that point in time moved out to California. Uh, we had no idea where we were going to live. Uh, you know, there was, there was no place, I mean, you know, there's people, um, people sub-sub-lease apartments and, and it's, it's crazy in, in Berkeley. So we did not end up living in Berkeley itself. We lived just in Northern Oakland, uh, but that was actually a pretty nice place to live. I would commute down uh, California 13, which is the most scenic, the most scenic uh, road in the Bay Area, I believe, unless you get up into Marin County, uh, but uh, it was fantastic. I loved, uh, I loved that drive uh, back and forth from North uh, Oakland to, uh, to Berkeley. It was fantastic. And, and then I had an opportunity to come uh, to, uh, to UT Southwestern, and uh, that was my first academic appointment. Uh, previously, I had been working on uh, photosynthetic uh, bacteria. And so these are all uh, bacteria that derive their energy for life uh, from light. And uh, I'd grown a variety of reds, purples, blues, and green uh, organisms uh, as a part of my uh, doctoral uh, and master's work. And then when I went to California, I decided to work on plants because, you know, if you're doing photosynthesis, you should at least know what, you know, uh, the two photosynthetic reaction centers are like instead of the bacterial that just have one. And, um, and, and so I did that at, at University of California, Berkeley. And then when I came here, all the plant work and all the bacterial work, except for uh, bacteria that I used to, to make proteins stopped, okay? And, uh, and I started working on, uh, on human diseases, okay? So, but there's still, uh, there's still a link uh, in uh, a thread through all of that. So anyway. Um, and so what have I done in relation to medical education? Well, <clears throat> In a very weak moment, the lady that was next door to me that was in neurology, she was a, a course administrator for the MS1 students. And so I believe she was um, teaching in the biochemistry section uh, at that point in time, but there was an exam that was coming up. She did not have enough proctors and I was next door and she said, hey, would you come down and help me proctor some uh, exams for the first year medical students. And I said, yeah, sure. That sounds like, uh, yeah, I could do that. No problem. So I did that and I got involved in doing more proctoring work. And then eventually that led to the point where I became an assistant course director for medical biochemistry. Now medical biochemistry here at UT South Southwestern was a big deal. Okay. It still is a big deal. Okay. Because um, we, we kind of think highly of the biochemistry department here at UT Southwestern, uh, rightly so, because we've had some uh, pretty amazing people here and, and still do. But that course ran as long as the first year anatomy course ran. Okay. And so we were, we were, we were kind of competing, I guess, uh, essentially with the anatomy course, uh, at least for time slots. And so we had four sections of the course. Uh, the first section of the course was on proteins and enzymes. Second section on the course was on DNA, RNA, and nucleic acids. Third section of the course was on lipids. And the, no, uh, the third section of the course was on carbohydrates. 
And the, uh, the fourth section on the course was on lipids. And we had this cast of characters, well, characters, some of them were really characters, uh, that you could, have, you, you could have put all of these lectures together back to back to back and put them on YouTube if there was such a thing at that point in time. And these would just be classic, classic medical biochemistry lectures. It would be fantastic. And so I did that for about 15 years and then I became a co-course director uh, for medical biochemistry. And that was uh, as we had made a curriculum change in, in a change in the curriculum uh, to, uh, to, to switch over. And we heard your voice. We, we heard the voice of the, of the students say that you, you wanted to truncate uh, the preclinical uh, time that you spent doing preclinical coursework into 18 months. Uh, and we were paring that down from two years to 18 months. And so we had to compress all of these things together. And we did that. And we managed to, uh, to produce a, a medical biochemistry class that was about uh, a month long. Okay. And so that was, that was taking a lot of stuff and squishing it together and then moving some parts and other parts around so that um, uh, we didn't lose the flavor of the course that we had at one point in time. And we didn't lose any of the, the important things that you would need uh, going forward in your careers uh, to be successful with USMLE tests uh, and with residency programs and that sort of thing. And so, um, and, and some of, one, of the, one of the diseases that I'll talk about tonight uh, is near and dear to my heart because that's what I've been working on. And we talk a lot about that and we have talked a lot about that uh, in medical biochemistry. Okay. So yeah, if you have any questions about that, we can, we can talk about that, but anyway, I'm moving on. Okay. Here we go. All right. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, central metabolism 101. Okay. Uh, oxidative decarboxylation of alpha keto acids in mitochondria. Wow, how did we get from medical, uh, uh, medical uh, education to this part? And, and this is just one of those things that you know, we, would, we would essentially you know, have a discussion about. And uh, the reason I have a discussion about this is because I've been working in these areas for uh, you know, the past 30 some odd years, okay? And um, of course, we don't think of pyruvate as a keto acid, but pyruvate is a keto acid. Uh, it's just not a keto acid that, that gets named as a keto acid because most of the keto acids come uh, from this left side of, of the table uh, in the chart, uh, which is talking about branch chain amino acid metabolism. So as opposed to glycolysis and glucose being metabolized down to, to pyruvate, we're talking about metabolism, oxidative, decarboxylation essentially of these um, amino acids. And these are three of the branch chain amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine. There's only three branch chain amino acids. And they're so-called because they have a branched uh, alphatic side chain in the chemical structure. And they have uh, methyl groups that are hanging off of those terminal branches. And so these are pretty special amino acids. Uh, they constitute 35% of the essential amino acids uh, or, or amino acids in, in muscle proteins. Okay, so 35% of your muscle proteins are made up of valine, isoleucine, and, and uh, leucine. And they comprise 50% of the essential amino acids in your dietary intake. Okay, so 50% of the amino acids that you consume, and just remember that, okay, because that's kind of a critical point as we move forward in talking about these things and related to disease, that's a, that's a big deal. And then um, they're required for protein lipid synthesis as well as metabolic signaling and transcriptional control, all right? And so what happens to these amino acids? They get transported, of course, uh, into the cells through specific transporters. And there's a group of specific transporters that transport all three of these amino acids. And then they get, uh, they have the opportunity to get transaminated, okay? And so they can get transaminated and then they become not amino acids, but they become alpha keto acids, okay? And so then those alpha keto acids can be transported from the cytosol into the mitochondria. And uh, there is a, a component, uh, a large uh, multi enzyme, multi component machine that's inside um, the mitochondria. 
and this branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase complex, crazy name, I agree, uh, is, uh, is waiting there to, to take on these uh, alpha keto acids and be able to decarboxylate them, okay? And so that, that becomes the, the, um, the committed uh, irreversible step because you, you take a, a carboxylate off of these keto acids and then you, you turn them into, eventually you turn them into an acyl-CoA. And this ACL-CoA gets metabolized through multiple other steps, but eventually it gets uh, converted into acetyl-CoA or succinyl-CoA, and then that enters into the Krebs cycle, okay? And so pyruvate does that in a lot shorter step, makes acetyl-CoA, pumps that into the mitochondria. And so any block in pyruvate can lead to uh, type 2 diabetes, primary lactic acidosis, and cancer. And in addition to that, any blocks over on the other side can lead to uh, disease states such as maple syrup urine disease. You may not have ever heard of maple syrup urine disease, but you are going to hear about that tonight. And you can also end up with cardiometabolic diseases. Okay, and so that's another thing that uh, we'll touch on as we move through the discussion tonight. Okay, so here we are. And... It's interesting that in a lot of disease states, you have these early indicators uh, that are essentially biomarkers and causal factors, okay, in several disease states, okay? And all of these things begin to rise and go up. And it's not like they go up a little bit, they double, triple, and quadruple in terms of their concentrations. Now that's not as high as what you would have if you had maple syrup urine disease, okay? In maple syrup urine disease, those uh, micromolar concentrations are converted into millimolar concentrations in many cases, okay? So uh, you can't metabolize the uh, keto acids because there's no way to metabolize the keto acids because the branch chain Keto acid dehydrogenase complex is not functional. And so those keto acids build up. And because the keto acids build up, you also give rise to build up in the branch chain amino acids. Okay. And so both of those things actually go up. But in this particular case, okay, that I just want to touch on here insulin resistance, obesity, cancer, sarcopenia, which is a muscle wasting um, disease that's age related, and heart failure. And in addition to that, maple syrup urine disease and neuropathies derived from maple syrup urine disease, all are indicators and, and point towards there being issue with branch chain amino acid metabolism. Okay, and so that's, it's, it's used, it, it, just, it just never really occurred to us that there was such a far reaching broad spectrum of uh, effects related to amino acid metabolism as there is here. You know, Max, so, let me let you take a breath for a second. Yep, you know, our, our, pres our president's lecture last, what, two weeks ago, I think, here yep. at Southwestern. Did you, did you hear that? It was, yep. it was absolutely touching on the relationship between the branch chains and cancer. Yep. Very interesting. Yeah, yep, it is. Absolutely. And so, and so I just want to, want to alert you to the, the fact that uh, two, groups of, two groups of women, okay, and, and both groups of women are obese, and one of the groups is diabetic and obese, all right? And there's a linear correlation with the increase in hemoglobin A1C as it relates to the glucose concentration in their bodies and leucine levels, okay? And so as leucine levels go up and hemoglobin A1C uh, goes up, well then this, this forms a, essentially a linear relationship uh, for uh, these women uh, that are obese and become type two diabetic, which is an insulin resistant state. Okay. All right, moving on. So because we were working with Mennonites, uh, people that come from, well, essentially Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, mainly, uh, that's where most of the Mennonites that we have had interactions with, uh, our good friend, Dr. Kevin Strauss, uh, works in that community, and uh, he has been good friends with a physician by the name of Dr. Holmes Morton. And Dr. Holmes Morton realized that the Mennonites, being a restricted 
um, inbred essentially group uh, of, of individuals and not wanting to uh, seek medical attention and seek medical help, uh, we're going to have to have medical care come to them. And so they brought in and built a hospital uh, in uh, Lancaster County, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, that's a children's hospital uh, for the Mennonites. And it's not just the, the Mennonites, uh, that, that the Mennonites suffer from maple syrup urine disease, uh, because they have, because they're inbred and have a limited or restricted gene pool, uh, they have other disorders as well. But, but because maple syrup urine disease is so prevalent in their community, one out of 150 live births is an affected, is an affected individual, as opposed to a one out of 180,000, okay, across the world, okay? That's a pretty big, um, pretty big problem. We were working on this disease back in, in the last century, and we had taken uh, to use a retroviral gene-mediated transfer to re-engineer the mutated uh, maple syrup urine disease cell lines and to correct the Mennonite defect. And we did that. We, we corrected it in, in cell culture. And uh, we thought, I mean, we were, we were you know, ecstatic that we did that uh, because it wasn't such an easy thing to do. Uh, retroviral viral gene mediated transfer wasn't uh, such a, a great way to do that. But in cell culture, it was fine, okay? And it worked just fine. Um, and we thought within a short period of time with all of the the uh, research that had been done on gene therapy, that within 10 years, that the Mennonites would be cured and that all of these genetic diseases would be fixed, okay? And that didn't happen, okay? But that is happening now, okay? There's a whole host of, of uh, gene therapy uh, that's being done on, on many, many different diseases. And uh, there's a, a study that we're working on now with Dr. Strauss, I uh, can't go into a lot of details about that. Um, you can ask me some questions about it and I'll tell you as much as I can, but uh, I can't even tell you the model that's being used for that disease yet, okay? But uh, uh, there's an abstract that's been submitted to the American Genetics uh, Program. And so um, anyway, things, things are moving forward. Uh, and I will tell you at this point in time that it's all positive. And it's all well. Right. It's the way of the future, Max. You yeah. know, there's there's yeah. CRISPR gene editing now yeah. for sickle for sickle cell anemia. Yeah. No. Exactly. So um, so here's a case presentation. Uh, I'm not uh, the person that would normally uh, make this kind of presentation. Okay, but I know some things about this particular case, and so I thought I'd just give it a shot. Okay. Now, my good friend, Dr. D. Bernardinas here on campus, who does one of the uh, one of the lectures to the PC1 students that we have on campus, he would say that, you know, when you have a kid come into the clinic, because he's a pediatrician, he can say this, so I'm just quoting what he says, that, that kids are kind of cranky, and kids come in for lots of different reasons. Parents are worried about them because, you know, this is the first child that they've had, they've never seen this before, and the kid is uh, not eating and is throwing up or is having lots of problems or has a temperature or something like that. And he would say, you know, there's lots of reasons for kids to not eat, to throw up and to have a temperature. And so anyway, but that's not the presentation that we have here. Presentation we have here is that you have a two week old male infant who was born to term, uneventful pregnancy and normal, normal birth, okay? And the patient presents a slightly irritable, poor feeding in the second week of life, okay? So it was going okay when he was born, it was apparently going okay through the first week, and then something is kind of now not, is, is not making him happy, okay? And, and then because this child was born in the state of Texas, there are 52 different things that he's heels, he has a heel prick and a, and a and a uh, blood card that's mailed out to the state to be able to check and see if he has anything that's irregular uh, in that blood sample, right? And so the patient's newborn screen shows abnormal levels of BCAAs, branched-chain amino acids are up. All right, what does that make you think? And so confirmatory testing is done on plasma amino acids that are collected at eight days 
and they show elevated levels of leucine. Well, if they show elevated levels of leucine, they probably show elevated levels of leucine, isoleucine, and valine. But sometimes those other amino acids don't go up as quickly as leucine goes up. And so that, you know, just, just something to bear in mind if you're a pediatrician, right? And the patient is admitted into the hospital and exhibited, ir okay, the patient there was admitted to the hospital and exhibited irritability, hypertonicity, okay, which is uh, just, uh, uh, he's not, he's, his, his body is not easily moved, okay, so he's kind of stiff, uh, tensed up, uh, high pitched scream, and he's, and he's, uh, and has sleepiness, okay, and so he's, he's not a happy camper. All right, and so then you, you find, you're ask, asking questions uh, of the parents, and uh, they say, well, uh, he's not uh, throwing up, okay, and he's not having any of these other uh, things that you would expect him to have if he were really uh, uh, having uh, other problems. And so uh, you've asked those questions, and then you do a physical exam on him, and you find that he's, uh, he's normothermic, Okay, he's normotensive, meaning his blood pressure is normal, and his other vital uh, stable uh, the signs are vital. Okay, lab test reveals that he has mild acidosis. Okay, so normal uh, serum bicarb, it should be running about 22 to 28, right, Dr. Feller? And then, uh, so that he, is correct, Max. That's and so, right. And so, and so now you can tell that his, his plasma is becoming acidotic, right? And so you're not seeing as much bicarb to be able to offset those effects. Ketosis, meaning uh, urine ketones are at 80 mg per deciliter, okay? 80 mg per deciliter, that's really high, okay? Should be somewhere around 15 or less, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a bad sign, okay? He's mild hypermononemia, uh, 80 micromolar per liter. And then his MRI, you, you do an MRI, apparently, in this case they did, and show restricted diffusion uh, on a number of structures that are in the brain, okay? And so this um, extensive bilateral T2 uh, MRI is looking for uh, hyperintensive areas in the brain, okay? And so this is actually indic indic indicative of demyelination and, um, and um, degeneration. Okay, and so this is uh, this is actually an adult. Okay, so this is not actually the child, but you can see the difference between the MSUD on the top and the control on the bottom. And I'm hoping that you can tell that there are more of the of the white areas, uh, these um, these areas of hyperintensity in the top structures of the brain, from the top of the brain down to the bottom of the brain than there are in the control on the bottom, okay? Because that should be the case. And that's an indication to you that, yes, you're looking at brain structures that are adversely affected and uh, this is not a good sign, right? If Dr. Fowler saw this, he would say, no, that's, that's a bad thing. That's not a good sign. Not a good sign, right. So, so the, the, the problem with the Mennonites is that they have uh, the worst uh, worst case scenario, uh, the worst phenotype for maple syrup urine disease. And it's, it's called the classical phenotype. And the classical phenotype means that they have the strong maple syrup odor. And that mainly comes from their urine because they don't produce a lot of other body, body fluids, but, but sweat, tears, and uh, other uh, body fluids, you know, could have this characteristic maple syrup smell. Now, I don't know that you would a pediatrician would pick this up immediately because the mother is able to dissipate the load of amino acids and the keto acids through the, through the placenta. And so that wouldn't show up uh, in the child uh, within a, a few days. And so you would probably be like this, uh, this clinical case scenario where the child comes in uh, maybe two weeks uh, after birth with uh, these problems. And then maybe at that point in time, you might be able to, de to detect if the, the phenotype was uh, classical phenotype, that there were maybe the presence of uh, these keto acids. And Max, so, for the students, for the yep. students benefit to have a newborn, very, very young baby, just recently yep. born now having this 
devastating sign of unable to tolerate a diet, vomiting constantly, weight loss. Uh, this is never, this is never normal. It's the kind of way you'd approach this child saying this kid is really sick. Really sick. Exactly. That's right. And unfortunately they, that happens and, and it doesn't just happen for MSUD. It can happen for PKU. It can happen for a lot of different things. Right. But the, the real thing is that the, the keto acids are, are the toxic thing that you need to get rid of or you need to get under control. And you would start uh, uh, restricting the diet of this child. You would place them on a, on a diet restrictive in uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And so they would get a newborn formula that had really low levels of uh, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And you, you would hope that that would bring down the keto acids, and, and normally it does. Uh, the, the risk, the real risk uh, long-term is neurological degeneration, uh, mental retardation, and if you can't get this under control, uh, eventually death. And so these are the clinical phenotypes for maple syrup urine disease. And you can see that classical patients have such low enzymatic activity. And, and really it, it's not, I mean, it would just be because you, you couldn't tell whether you were at zero or whether you were, you were at 2%. It was, it's, it's just that difficult when you're doing the, when you're doing the assays. And so we would do the assays. We've had a number of uh, pediatricians that have mailed us samples, either um, and these would be blood samples, uh, lymphoblast or fibroblast. And we grow these up, uh, mortalize them in cell culture, and then uh, run enzymatic tests on them. Now, when I first got here, uh, we were looking at, at mapping genes. We were looking at mapping uh, genes to chromosomes. We were looking at uh, mapping the gene structure, uh, numbers of introns and exons. And because we had these uh, pediatricians that were mailing us uh, cell lines, we were interested to see if we could determine where the mutations were. And so we were uh, determining mutations uh, point mutations, uh, deletions, insertions that would lead to uh, abnormalities uh, of the proteins that were being produced. Intermediate and intermittent are very close to each other, and it's very difficult to kind of tell uh, which is which based, on, based upon enzymatic activity. Uh, just know that um, intermittent typically happens um, late onset. And so uh, there was a woman that was in Canada and she uh, got married, uh, was doing fine, had a, a pregnancy. And when she got pregnant, then she, she got sick. Okay. And because uh, there was the stress on her body, she had about 20%. She was an intermittent patient. She had about 20% of normal activity, but that wasn't enough under the conditions of her pregnancy to be able to get out from uh, having uh, effects from the, the keto acids and the uh, high levels of amino acids. And so uh, we actually were able to diagnose her and uh, determine where her mutation was. And so that's um, an interesting thing. If you uh, have some questions about that, we can talk about that later. And then there's a group of, of patients that are thymine responsive. And so thymine is a, is a vitamin B deri derived uh, component, um, thymine pyrophosphate, and so, uh, or actually thymine diphosphate. And so, um, and that becomes a cofactor for one of the first committed steps in the, um, in the uh, pathway. Okay, and so we'll talk about that in just a minute. And so some patients you can treat with high doses of thymine and they have pretty normal levels of activity. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of those patients um, uh, has a mutation that's right in the thymine uh, binding site and so it's not surprising that if you gave them higher levels of thymine, you'd be able to offset the effects of the mutation to some extent. Then there are also some E3 deficient uh, patients. Now, E3 deficiency is a problem. Uh, E3 is shared with these other components. And so the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, uh, the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, and the branch chain dehydrogenase complex have the same gene product for E3. Okay, and so they all share the same E3 protein. So if you've got a deficiency in E3, then you've got a problem with pyruvate, with alpha ketoglutarate, and with uh, branch chain as well. So that's a big problem. That's, that's a huge problem. All right, 
And so these are the ones that we, um, we feel like that um, we're trying to target because, because there is some regulatory molecules that we're trying to control. And if we can control those reg regulatory molecules, then we can increase the activity for these patients. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. You know, so Max, uh, yep. you know, Max, when I see a ketoacidosis in the ER, yep. I, never, I never think of this. No. You know, I, I always assume that it's a diabetes issue. That's you know, exactly it's, right. It's either a relative or absolute lack of insulin. Yeah. Um, either right. uh, insulin receptor, um, uh, a problem with insulin receptors, or exactly. in fact, that it's an absolute insulin deficiency. I never think of this. No, I don't, I don't think you would, because, because you, would, you would normally think that if they were going to be diagnosed as MSUD, they would have already been diagnosed before they got to your clinic, okay? And so if it's somebody that's coming into your clinic, you know that they're you know, nine times out of 10 or maybe more than that are, are uh, diabetic, Most, more, more than likely diabetic ketoacidosis, right? So this is the machine. And so this is just a cartoon uh, version of the machine. Uh, that's what we call it. Uh, the 4.5 megadalton machine as opposed to the nine megadalton machine for the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And so you can see that uh, this E2 component, which is called the trans acylase, is a 24 merit core. And uh, that's made up of eight trimers. And at the vertices of these cubes are the trimers and they're all collected together. And then coming out of that is a portion of um, uh, kind of disordered protein uh, it's not ordered in terms of structure. It's not ordered in terms of what it's attached to. Uh, but then it runs into another portion of the molecule uh, called the subunit uh, binding um, domain, this SVD right here, right? So there's a little uh, portion of protein, and it's not big. It's like a helix turn helix. And that is all that is necessary for being able to take this decarboxylase, the first committed step, uh, the first enzyme in, in the pathway, and be able to uh, tether it to the complex, all right? And then there's another uh, unordered or disordered part of the molecule that comes out, um, and then uh, this lipoic acid binding domain is uh, 84 amino acids uh, that's at the very end terminus of the protein. So that it goes from end terminus all the way down towards this uh, SBD binding domain, and then finally towards the C-terminus where there's this active site and that's uh, for binding CoA in the, the center of the core uh, E2 molecule. And then the E3, actually it's interesting because the E3 molecule and the E1 molecule actually bind to the same region. And it is only because of how the, the molecules packed for the E1 that allows some space to get carved out for only E3 to be able to bind. And so about 18, 12 to 18 molecules of E1 will bind per 20 former, and the rest of those will be about six uh, E3 molecules that will be bound to a 20 former. These two guys, this kinase and this phosphatase, actually phosphorylate E1 or the phosphatase dephosphorylates E1. And so the, phosph the, the kinase actually phosphorylates and, and, and activates by adding two phosphates to the E1 component and the phosphatase will remove those and reactivate the complex. And so that's negative, negative regulation uh, for, uh, for the kinase. And this is the reaction that just um, gives so, you- So Max, if I understand that, what you're saying is that the way cellular, at least human, and I guess you would know other animals, mice possibly. Well, so they're, so they're, bacteria actually have a similar complex, but they don't have the regulatory components. And so, and, yeah. And, and so thus our type of life, human life and other related, have evolved a mechanism by which these molecules feed back to regulate bad stuff. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. And so the whole point is that they're trying to, to conserve as much as possible uh, these amino acids and the keto acids and under the right conditions to make sure the keto acids don't build up in the body. 
and cause toxic levels. Right. All right. So Max, take a breath for a moment. In 19, I was applying for medical school 50 years ago, a half a century ago, before you were born. <laughs> no, no, and, no, no, no. Not, not, that, not quite that long. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and in the fall of, well, in the summer of 73, I was handed, as I started medical school, a, a copy of, of, that, of an article from that famous medical journal, Scientific American, yeah. which, which showed an actual electron micrograph of the trilaminar cell membrane just been discovered. Yes. Now, now, my question to you is of the stuff that's on the slide, including the regulatory pathways that you've described, the feedback mechanisms here, how much of that has been discovered since you've been out of school? And so I will tell you, that that's a really, really good question. I, I appreciate you asking that question because I was just thinking, you know, there was there was a thing that I had, had meant to mention. And that is when I walked into the laboratory, okay, my first day into the laboratory, nothing, none of this stuff was known. We didn't even know that there was a kinase. We didn't even know there was a phosphatase, okay, uh, for sure, okay. And the best pictures that we had of this whole machine were from uh, electron micrographs. And the electron micrographs only showed this, this E2 uh, 24 meric truncated core uh, that you could clearly see, and that's it. And the rest of it, you just, you knew, well, it had to be there somewhere, but you didn't know where it was, right? And systematically, I would say through the next 25 years, we, we uh, initially came through uh, solved this molecule uh, in, uh, with, with the help of uh, a laboratory up in Seattle. Uh, they had previously solved this structure for the E2 molecule, the core. We uh, solved the subunit binding domain and the lipoic acid uh, binding domains using NMR technology. Uh, we solved the uh, X-ray crystal structure for the E3 molecule. And then we solved the, the BDK and the BDP uh, phosphatase structures. And the, all of those structures uh, have been essentially solved uh, here in our lab or in collaboration with other laboratories. Yeah. And so, Max, there's one other thing that you did. You've drawn the shapes of these molecules. Yeah. Could you, com could you comment for a moment why the shape is so important? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can. And, and so... <clears throat> uh, it's, it's interesting that this young lady that I was talking about that was an intermittent uh, MSUD phenotype, she has a mutation that resides right at the boundary uh, in the trimer, uh, tri trimer interaction, okay? And so uh, she cannot make the 24 meric complex. She can only make a trimer. She can't make a 24 mer And the 24 meric complex allows for... Uh, allows for this molecule and this molecule and these other molecules to move over the surface uh, like a soccer ball, okay? And it, if you don't have that kind of shape where things can move around in a hand over hand fashion, then it's very, very difficult and the efficiency of the whole machine is compromised. And so it's no surprise that she only has 20% activity, even though, even though there's nothing wrong with uh, the way her uh, components work individually. The components work just fine, but because they're not put together in this really efficient way of channeling substrate around in a hand over hand fashion, then she is just, that's all she has is 20% activity. And so these molecules are tailor-made uh, and specifically tailor-made for this complex. And so this kinase, uh, this kinase, I'll show you in just a minute, binds to this lipoic acid binding domain right here. And because it binds to this lipoic acid do binding domain, it's right next to the E1 that allows it to, to take a phosphate from an ATP and, and throw it over here onto the E1 into a specific site and to inactivate the complex. So, so Max, as I understand it, <clears throat> DNA is transcribed to RNA in human physiology. Yes, sir. And then the uh, RNA is then translated into molecules that go do stuff. Right. And so 
it seems then that the way that the way the code, the genetic code is written, controls for the shape of these various um, enzymes that you see. Is that correct? Well, it, to some to some to some extent, it it does. Yeah, it, that's that's true. <laughs> right, right. And so you know, it's all dependent upon you know how you where you need to have a serine versus where you need to have a threonine versus where you need to have a histidine, right? And that makes all the difference in terms of function, uh, structure and function relationships. And so, and so here we're looking at a structure that relates to how the molecules function in vivo inside the mitochondria, right? And so, and so Max, I have to tell you that when I'm holding down a screaming drunk or, <laughs> or uh, I'm rarely thinking about the status of the shape of his molecules. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. And so, so I will tell you that I, when I was in graduate school, there was a, there was a guy that came to talk uh, from Rice University. And, and we always think, you know, that if you went to Rice, you know, you must be smart, right? You must be really, really smart. And, uh, and he was, he was really, really smart. But he, he was fantastic because he had been studying all of these soluble paraplasmic binding proteins. And so he, he uh, and so there's, there's in bacteria, Bacteria need to know where the concentrations are for sugars and, and, and things that they're going to live off of. And they need to regulate how they swim and how they tumble to be able to feed and, and get the nutrients that they need. And so they have all of this orchestrated things that are telling you know one molecule and another molecule and another molecule to slow things down so they can, they can ingest all of this, uh, these goodies that are in solution versus you know, where they want to maybe just swim through this area that's low concentration to a higher concentration. And, and he just popped up one slide after another like this of these molecules onto the screen. And I was just, I was blown away. I mean, that's the first, that's the first presentation I ever saw of structure, uh, X-ray crystal structure uh, to the atomic detail uh, levels that uh, gave me the idea that it's this amino acid and not that amino acid that's critical in an active site for giving rise to the function of a protein. Max, isn't it astonishing that it's evolution could have happened in the, Yeah. Isn't that evolution could have happened in a way like this? You know, it's right. it's very interesting to read about the history of the Earth and the movement of the tectonic plates from three and a half billion years forward, and the gradual coming of. Um, um, oxygen secreting uh, cyanobacteria, for example, right, that exactly. finally led about 600 million years ago to uh, the uh, to the Krebs cycle type of, uh, of vast production of energy that allowed these cellular processes to yeah. evolve and take off to the point where it could make oxygen. Yeah, right. And to the point where multicellular organisms could could evolve. That's right. Yep. Critical things critical things. And so stuff that, you know, you just, you just read about and, and you, you saw in a textbook and then now you, you're, you're trying to figure it out in a laboratory. Amazing. So this is the, this is the, um, uh, the reaction schemes, you know, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of all of this uh, because you've been tortured enough with the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and all of the reaction cycles that go on with the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. I just want to make a couple of points about this, and that is that once the substrate binds, and so that is this uh, alpha keto acid right here, and this alpha keto acid is derived from valine, okay? And so this valine, and, and it's in the form of keto isovaleric acid, comes in and binds to two different uh, points on the E1 molecule, one on this side in between an alpha and a beta, and one on the back side in between an alpha and a beta and then gets decarboxylated just like that. And after that, that reaction happens, okay? No substrate or no product is released as it goes all the way around the cycle to the point where you actually uh, take and, and take this acyl group and then link it to coenzyme A, and then that gets released out of the E2 core. And then of course, uh, several other things have to happen to reset the cycle so it can start all over again. But this is a substrate, uh, a substrate channeling uh, reaction that is channeled around through the activity of this complex. And it is even more complicated than this, okay? So I told you about the transaminase. And so there's an enzyme called BCAT, 
branch chain amino acid transaminase, okay? And that transaminase actually takes the amino acid, valine, converts it into this KIV, uh, ketoisovaleric acid, that then can bind to E1. And we think that that forms a complex, we know it does, it forms a complex with this system. And, and that whole machinery is now something called a metabolon, okay? And so uh, reactants that are taken from uh, differing pathways, differing structures, and are funneled all the way through uh, a single uh, step in the process um, form this uh, substrate channel metabolome. Uh, uh, Max, yep. let me grab that word. Metabolome, yep. is that what mm -hmm. you're using? Yeah, metabolome, uh, yes. For the students, there are increasing number of chemicals that we can monitor in the bloodstream and various fluids in the body. And what Dr. Absolutely. Wynn was just talking about was the increasing ability to be able to do tests that look for products. For example, when someone gets creamed uh, in a football injury, helmet on helmet, and suffers a traumatic brain injury, we can actually see brain breakdown products <clears throat> called metabolomes. Same thing happens to heart muscle, for example, after a heart attack or other heart stresses. So I, I just wanted to grab that word, Max. I know. Great. I'm glad you did. Thanks for jumping in. Okay, hey, Max. Um, hey, Max. Yes, so I remember studying so much the words on paper, but not the shapes of the molecules. Are right. the students, and by the way, you've got 330 kids hanging on every word <laughs> you're saying right now <clears throat> from all over the world. Uh, are, th are they going to be studying shapes or words? Are they going to be seeing acetyl-CoA uh, or are they going to be seeing the shape of the actual enzyme? No, I, I think that they're, they're going to be looking at the structure of, this, of, of the molecules like co coenzyme A, for instance. Uh, but probably even to, to a lesser extent than that, uh, it, it's going to be essentially words on paper. And that's the unfortunate thing, because I think the, the elegance of the system, uh, you know, and, and, it, you know, and when we you know, give lectures to students, uh, we sometimes will show them uh, the details that we have on a slide like this. And it's to, to drive home the point that, that, the, that the biology and the science is very complicated, but it is built and constructed in, in a certain way to be able to perform a certain function uh, that, is, uh, that is not able to be performed in other ways. And so it is all put together in this complex and elaborate system uh, to do just this particular thing. You know? And so it is unfortunate that we can't so show all the structures and talk about all the structures. Yeah. Hey, Max, I was at a party at a urologist's house back in the 80s. And of course, the smartest guy in the room was the nephrologist. His name was Dr. Wallum. I think he's passed now. And I, I remember sitting, having a glass of wine with Dr. Wallum. And I said, Dr. Wallum, <clears throat> do you think that we will ever know every enzyme, every hormone in the human body, every receptor? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I mean, this was, this yeah. was 35, this was 35 years ago, Max. Th think of what we learned since then. Yes. <clears throat> he said, absolutely not. I said, what do you mean? He said, um, it's an infinite series, he said, and that the evolutionary pressure to develop created an infinite series and that we may never know every molecule. I, I know you saw the, uh, uh, to the students, one of our Nobel laureates at UT Southwestern, Bruce Boitler, is an immunologist. Right. And he recently produced a paper looking at 60% of the mouse genome. The mouse mm -hmm. genome is very similar to the human genome. Right. Lo looking at the control of the immune system of the body. He identified over 100 new candidates for control of the immune system in 60% of the mouse genome up, that were previously not identified. And he said this, uh, Max, he said, in the remaining 40%, there are at least a thousand more candidates. Would, wouldn't you like to be around a hundred years from now to see the fact that the things we think about now are totally right. ignored because they've been replaced? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a picture of Bruce in just a minute. I'll show you, I'll pop it up. Cool. Uh, but, I, but I have to talk about this, this structure for, for a moment because this reminds me of my friend Steve. Uh, Steve. Steve gave me a cookie jar uh, for my wedding present. 
And I used to take the lid off the cookie jar and reach in uh, and, and take something <clears throat> out that was really, really nice and edible. And I always remembered Steve because I made this link. My brain made this link to something that was really, really good that I was, I was taking the lid off of this cookie jar, reaching out. And so I had this emotional connection, okay? And a lot of your, your uh, patients and a lot of Dr. Fowler's patients have an emotional connection to food, okay? I do not have an emotional connection to food, okay? I mean, I just eat it if it's there. If it's not, I don't. But, but there are some people that have a real, real intense emotional connection to food. And, and that um, emotional connection that I was describing of taking the lid off the cookie jar, reaching in, that's an emotional connection to food. And that's a very difficult thing to try to break for people that are very addicted to food. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, this is the Grow El Grow ES uh, uh, chaperone machine, essentially, uh, that is allowing, uh, would allow for uh, a molecule to that is unfolded, uh, an unfolded protein to be able to, to be incorporated into the cookie jar. And the lid, the Grow ES complex coming on the top of the cookie jar, concerted ATP hydrolysis uh, to be able to, uh, to spin the molecule around, to be able to make conformational changes in a concerted fashion all at the same time. All seven of these structures hydrolyze ATP at the same time. And boom, the protein gets released inside the cavity to fold up. And if it folds up and it doesn't restick to the inside of the complex, then the grow ES pops off and then out comes the protein. And so that is an amazing thing. I mean, it's just an amazing machinery. And this machinery is all designed to, to be able to help assemble things inside bacteria. Um, and it gets hijacked sometimes by the bacteriophage that are infecting bacteria to be able to uh, help fold structures up but anyway, uh, I'm using this uh, protein to be able to fold up one of my uh, favorite molecules. And this just shows you what happens in the process. So I just told you all of that sort of thing, uh, you know, by, uh, by uh, this discussion we had over the last slide. But here- One of our questions, one of our questions just popped up in chat about sure. how the calcium influx affects the contraction uh, is that true in that molecule you just showed? No, no, not in this molecule. This molecule is all bent on hydrolyzing ATP. And so this molecule has got uh, 14 subunits. The grow L molecule part has seven on one end, seven on the other, and it's symmetrical. And then uh, when ATP binds all the way around one ring, and it doesn't get hydrolyzed until the ES molecule binds to the top of it. And then that controls the rapid simultaneous hydrolysis uh, of uh, ATP. And then, then uh, you know, proteins get folded up or they don't get folded up, they bind back to the complex or they get released from the complex. And so what I'm showing you here in this slide is I have a mutant and it's a, uh, it's a, it's a threonine uh, 268 arginine. And so this particular patient has a threonine that 268, 265 on the E1 alpha subunit that gets converted into an arginine molecule. And that arginine is at a, at a critical place for the folding of the E1 alpha molecule. And it's at a, such a critical place that, that, that in a patient, you would never see a folded protein for this molecule. Okay, and so I have only hijacked the bacteria with the help of the grow EL and the grow ES to be able to make this protein. And, and the only thing I've been able to do is make an actual intermediate. And that intermediate, is showing an E1 alpha and an E1 beta that both of these are bound to the, the grow EL, okay? And so this gave us the first hint that the assembly process for the, um, for the, the decarboxylase, the one that's alpha two, beta two, is an alpha and a beta and an alpha and a beta. And so those, those dimers of alpha and betas fold up to form two uh, alpha and betas, uh, heterodimers to form the tetrameric complex. So, yeah, so that's, that's just, uh, I'm just, just giving you uh, a little a flavor of laboratory jargon and laboratory wizardry that we were able to, uh, to use like magic to be able to fold these proteins partially to the extent that we could, we could look at their assembly pathway. 
And so when we did this uh, process, and we, I mean, you take these very pure uh, proteins that bacteria are produced in bacteria that you're able to purify through various steps in the laboratory. And then you, you put them into, um, you know, into salts and into uh, polyethylene glycol solutions and various other additives to be able to tease them to the point where they're, they're concentrated enough uh, and they begin to come out of solution and, and they become out of solution in a very orderly way to the point that they don't just, they don't just uh, all uh, precipitate out of solution, but they, they begin to orderly uh, bind into each other, uh, these molecules and form crystals. And it's these crystals that we can actually take and do diffraction studies on uh, at you know, Argonne National Laboratory, uh, for instance. Uh, there's many other places that you can take a synchrotronic radiation source of electrons that are being, uh, that are being piped in uh, to a, a lead room. And, uh, and you, can, uh, you can take your crystals and expose them to all these x-rays and then uh, take the diffraction pattern from uh, the crystals and be able to uh, determine the structure. And so this is uh, the uh, beam line uh, number 19 and I actually had the chance to, to go to Argonne Laboratories and to uh, do studies on, on uh, X-ray diffraction using the uh, Argonne Laboratory uh, at uh, Chicago. So it's a fantastic place. The cool thing is they have these, uh, these tricycle uh, bicycles uh, that they allow people to ride around the synchrotron. Uh, it's about a mile and a half around, all the way around, uh, if you go all the way around. And um, it's... Uh, you know, people don't always want to walk around there. So they, they get on bicycles and you pedal around. So that was an interesting an interesting thing to do. But this room is about 40 uh, feet by 20 feet and it's all lead. And so the doors are closed by computers and everything is operated uh, in very safe fashion uh, before the shutters are open and the room is flooded with x-rays. And so these are uh, all of the alpha and beta mutations that we knew about about five years ago. And so there's a whole bunch of them and they all do kind of different things, okay? So the red ones uh, are amino acid residues that are, are close to or have something to do with this THDP uh, or this thymine pyrophosphate moiety that's a cofactor down in the E1 in between the E1 and alphas and the E1 beta subunits. Uh, the orange ones are actually hydrophobic residues down in the core of either the beta or the alpha protein. And the, the uh, blue ones are ones that have contacts either between the alpha and the beta or the alpha beta uh, heterodimers. And so uh, that took a little bit of time to construct all of those things and to make a decision about what all of those residues do. And we did that for each one of the proteins. And uh, that was just published in a review and, and, and then we just left it and that's where it sets. And so I just thought, you know, that's really a tragedy uh, that we couldn't have had more exposure uh, to the scientific community than just that. But uh, anyway, and so this is the pathway that I was talking about in terms of the assembly process of how the proteins fold up from the alpha, the individual beta uh, molecules, how, uh, amino acid uh, mutations can affect that folding process and block that process. So we know that in the Mennonite uh, community, uh, these uh, mutations that are uh, essentially Y393, uh, F364, and Y368, uh, those are mutations that are towards the C terminus of the alpha protein. And the Y393N mutation is in the is the classical Mennonite uh, mutation in the Mennonite community. And what that does is it blocks the heterodimer from being able to dimerize and form the tetramer. And so you essentially just have uh, the, uh, the, the heterodimer and that's all you have. Now you can bind the heterodimer to the, to the E2 molecule, it just has no function. And so, um, and so structure and amino acids depict function. Yeah, that's very true. So the complex is built on this reversible phosphorylation, dephosphorylation cycle. So active is dephosphorylated, inactive is the phosphorylated. Uh, kinase competes uh, for, for putting on phosphates. The phosphatase competes for taking off phosphates. And so 
uh, you just have this uh, yin yang uh, process that goes back and forth, back and forth. So we're trying to develop uh, inhibitors that would bind to this molecule. This is the, the BDK, uh, and it's a homodimer. And so you can see that the, uh, the, the backside of these uh, beta strands actually form uh, the regions that bind to each of the monomers to form the dimer. And then we can take that apart. Uh, we can move that around a little bit and we can see that there's a regulatory uh, four helix bundle on one side that has a putative allosteric binding site here. And then we can see where the uh, ATP binds at the top of this particular structure at the active site. And that's on the C-terminus. So the N-terminus is the regulatory domain. The C-terminus is the catalytic domain and binds the nucleotide. And let's see. So um, by, by targeting this molecule, okay? And so uh, I need to just take a little bit of, of a break and, and tell you some things about what happened um, in a disease state, okay? So let's assume that you're type two diabetic and you're insulin resistant and uh, your glucose levels go up, uh, but you're not to the point where you have to take insulin. What that means is that your liver now has a substantial amount of this particular molecule, the kinase, that is binding to this particular complex. And it is D, it is phosphorylating the molecule and leading to inactive complex. And so your liver that normally has active complex can take the um, amino acids that have been converted into keto acids by the muscle that have been shipped to the liver and take those keto acids and break those keto acids down in the uh, decarboxylation of uh, uh, the uh, keto acids. Uh, can't do that anymore, okay? And so that causes problems, okay? Uh, and it causes problems uh, from a number of standpoints, uh, but... Uh, Is that because the binding sites are saturated because there's so much keto acid being generated? Or No, it has, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that once the glucose levels in the patients go up, okay, then the, there's a transcription factor called carbohydrate responsive they're called carbohydrate responsive element binding protein. And for whatever reason, that transcription factor upregulates about 200 different genes once it gets turned on by glucose and by products of glucose. And for whatever reason, that molecule, that transcription factor is a positive upregulator for this kinase. And when that transcription factor begins to sense the increased levels of glucose in the plasma, it upregulates this kinase. And that upregulation of this kinase shuts down the complex for being able to metabolize these keto acids in the liver, which then has an effect on the amino acids in the muscle. And that all causes all kinds of problems, okay? So anyway. I, I did not know that. So yeah. excellent reason to take care of your blood sugar, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. And so anyway, uh, we did a we did a high throughput screen and uh, pulled out one of these components that binds to this allosteric site, and I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. Uh, but I want to go through some cell data real quick, uh, so you can see that uh, by treating uh, wild type uh, enzymes that are over here on this side, okay, and we can take untreated and we can treat them with various different components. And we can show that uh, we can go from pretty low levels of activity to pretty high levels of activity with some of these components, okay? And then we can take the, and do the same experiment with different mutations. And we can look and see what the effects are of some of those mutations. And so even though the activity is really low here for this R252H, uh, that's an E1 alpha uh, uh, mutation uh, in the E1 alpha uh, structure, you can actually see that you can get probably fourfold or fivefold increase in activity levels from almost nothing to, you know, something that's, well, I don't know, maybe uh, 15%, 10%, 15%, okay? 20% is a breakover where you really need to be to have no effects or no ill effects uh, from uh, 
from just a metabolic standpoint. Here, this particular K252, K, the K252N um, E2, uh, the interesting thing is that, that, and I don't know for what reason the data came back showing that there's essentially no effect of these kinase inhibitors. Uh, but that is the, the, the patient that I was telling you about that had, that was 20 years old and then had pregnancy and, and we figured out where her mutation was and, and those kinds of things. And I was telling you that she only had 20% activity through these particular mutations and using these kinase inhibitors. We can't really help her activity much. And so it's probably because uh, the kinase and how the kinase moves over the complex that is not being affected to the same extent that it's being affected by the wild type protein. Similarly, you can take another E2 mutation, you can see activity increase for those. And so that's why we, we think that these intermediate intermittent uh, patients would be amenable to treating with a kinase inhibitor to be able to give them a bump up in terms of their activity levels. And a twofold increase is a huge level of increase to prevent them from being in metabolic decompensation. Uh, we've taken OBOB mice and we've treated OBOB mice with these inhibitors. And so OBOB mice are really uh, uh, metabolically uh, deranged uh, from the standpoint that they, you know, they don't respond to, to leptin uh, because they, they don't have uh, normal leptin. Uh, their insulin levels are off. Their glucose levels are really off. Their lipid levels are really messed up. And all of these amino acids are really high too. And so we use this as kind of a proof of principle that we, could, that we could make a big change on the amino acids and the keto acids. We could make a big change on the activity state. And so you can see uh, the, the top uh, graph on A is the activity change between heart, liver, kidney, muscle, and white adipose tissue. And so you can see that their activity state in the liver is mostly phosphorylated inactive. And if we treat them with a kinase inhibitor, we can bring down that activity uh, uh, we can decrease the kinase activity and increase, um, uh, increase the, um, the activity for the treated samples uh, compared to the wild type samples. So that just tells us that, that we can make a big change if we treat you know, daily for a certain period of time. And this was actually for four weeks uh, treatment with BT2 at 40 mg per kg. Uh, we've treated for a shorter period of time uh, for two weeks, uh, um, and this is uh, diet-induced obese mice, and we see similar effects. The amino acids don't go down as much in the treated samples. The keto acids go way down, and so we, we can make a big, big difference on the keto acids by just knocking down the kinase activity. And I, when I say knock down the kinase activity, what I mean is these inhibitors bind to the kinase, and the kinase gets removed from the scaffold. Okay, and because it gets removed from the scaffold, the proteasome comes in and actually turns over the kinase. And so the kinase gets turned over. It gets uh, essentially destroyed. Protein doesn't. It doesn't come back and bind to the protein, uh, to the protein scaffold until you make new kinase. And so we think that that's a, a big bonus uh, in terms of treating, uh, doing a, a similar treatment like this to, in human patients. Uh, you can see that the glucose tolerance test in the mice actually show lower levels of glucose and insulin tolerance test shows actually good uh, behavior to insulin levels. The insulin levels themselves don't actually go down, but the, the response to insulin, insulin tolerance test is actually improved. That's on the graphs on the bottom, right? Yeah, yeah, that's on the graphs on the bottom, right. Now, in terms of chemical space that we're targeting, uh, we're targeting three different chemical spaces, okay? And so there's um, this uh, ATP, I already told you about the ATP binding pocket being uh, at the active site in the C uh, terminal portion of the molecule, the C terminal domain. In the, the middle of this four helix bundle in the N terminal regulatory region is this BT2 molecule that is able to bind in the middle of this four helix bundle. And because it binds right underneath where the lipoic acid molecule would bind and hold this this kinase tethered to the complex right next to the E1 component, then uh, the, uh, by the binding of BT2, we eliminate the ability for the lipoic acid to bind to the molecule. Kinase comes off and gets turned over by proteasome activity. And so this um, is a um, 
process in which we're doing a high through another high throughput screen to identify additional candidates, uh, additional chemical space candidates, so that we can patent molecules, so that we can use those molecules as uh, IND investigational new drugs. And so this cartoon just gives you a little bit of flavor for how our minds conceptualize the kinase coming together and phosphorylating uh, the E1 alpha components that are on uh, the E1 alpha. And, and if you think about this, the E1 is actually fixed uh, in, in space. It is because it's tethered to the SPD, it's not able to rotate around freely. And, and so it just moves this direction. Uh, it can move in and out, but, but it mainly just moves back and forth. And so there's one side that gets phosphorylated and that is enough to be able to inactivate the entire complex. We don't have to get two phosphates onto the other two uh, serine groups that are on the alpha subunit uh, on the backside. We just need to get one, actually essentially one serine residue is enough to inactivate uh, uh, the entire complex. Yeah. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, we're in, interested in, in uh, treating maple syrup urine disease. We're also interested in treating cardiometabolic diseases uh, because uh, as the keto acids go up, they produce reactive oxygen species in the heart. This causes big, big problems uh, for, for people that have heart problems uh, as, as well. Uh, and uh, then uh, because the amino acids go up as well, leucine uh, is actually signaling mTOR and mTOR causes uh, cardiac hypertrophy. And so the tissue that's not supposed to grow in the heart begins to grow and, and enlarge and thicken, and that causes problems. And so uh, we know that we know from, from lots of work that's been done, model studies that we have, have done here and model studies that have been done with our collaborators at UCLA, that these are prime candidates. Uh, so new investigational uh, drugs uh, are targeting, are being targeted hopefully for cardiometabolic diseases. And uh, we're doing in the midst of doing large animal uh, gene therapy treatment. So we have one animal. I can't tell you what kind of animal it is, um, but it is has uh, been uh, CRISPR knocked out for the E1 subunit. And then we've taken uh, uh, a adeno-associated virus and been able to restore uh, the normal activity for that animal. And uh, that animal is particularly sensitive, very sensitive to increasing levels of these keto acids and under normal conditions, that animal would have died within about a week. And so this animal is now survived for six months. And so we think that uh, that's uh, sufficient grounds to say that we've cured at least one animal that was a CRISPR knockout with adenovirus associated gene mediated therapy. Wow. Which Holy is pretty, God. pretty darn cool because we thought that was going to happen 20 years ago and it just, it just stopped. I mean, it just, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And now we've done that. And another, there's another animal that's, that will be born this summer. And we're going to dose that animal with a, with a two or three times higher level to try to get the, the, the concentration down. So the only thing that you can really do that's therapeutically uh, a fix for maple syrup urine disease patients is give them a liver transplant. And so the liver has enough activity to be able to dissipate the load for these keto acids throughout their system uh, if you just give them a liver transplant. But, you know, then they're on immunosuppressants for the rest of their lives. And, you know, Dr. Fowler could tell you that that's not a great thing. But as opposed to living with MSUD and having to control your diet, it, it's probably a more suitable thing. But uh, having gene therapy as a, as a possible um, avenue for therapeutics uh, is, a, is a way cooler thing, way better. Holy cow. Holy. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. That is that is, that that is just like, you know, the the jump up and down. Uh, Max, I wish you could see all the yay <laughs> and congratulations that are coming in over the chat. No, right that, that's just fantastic. So we in, in addition to, to looking at um, at kinase um, inhibitors, we filed a patent uh, on the pyruvate dehydrogenase inhibitors. We had a, a really smart group of chemists here. And, and with pyruvate, it's a lot more complicated. I mean, you know, you think, you know, it's complicated enough, right? Uh, with just one kinase, but with, with pyruvate, you've got four different kinases and they all do four different things depending upon, you know, what, what you need to do with your pyruvate. And so it's amazing 
Uh, but disease makes a huge, huge difference, uh, especially as it relates to the pyruvate complex. And um, we know that uh, we can, we can, um, we can hit uh, those four kinases with a, a single um, isoform um, uh, inhibitor, and it will inhibit all of those complexes. You know, complexes. Max Pyruvate is my best friend because I am forever, uh, as you well know, but the students may, many of them may not know that after the glycolytic pathway, the proceeds from the pathway go through pyruvate on then into uh, the Krebs cycle to generate much, much, much more ATP. Well, when I have a patient in shock, they've been shot and, and are bleeding to death or they're infected in their sepsis uh, or they've had terrible diarrhea and they're dehydrated, but they come in in shock instead of the pyruvate going into the uh, in, into the Krebs cycle, it goes instead to lactate and lactate is my enemy. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, okay. I mean to butt in. Exactly. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. So <clears throat> this is just showing you that, that, you know, the things are a lot more complicated on the, on the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex side. Um, bigger. Uh, one thing is for sure. It's bigger. It has more regulatory molecules as four, four, one, two, three, four kinases and two phosphatases. It has its own uh, E3 binding protein, uh, which we determine structure of. Uh, it has the decarboxylase. We've determined the, the structure for that decarboxylase. And we just determined the structure for all four of the, of the pyruvate kinases and uh, one of the phosphatates. Uh, that was just, we, we, were, we were having a slow day. We didn't know what else to do. So this is kind of this is kind of the imagined uh, structure uh, that we think about when we think about the decoration and the the um, and how things are tethered to the core. And so this is a a, a uh, icosododecahedron. Uh, and so you, this is the 60 meric core, not the 24 meric core uh, for the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And you can see these tethers that are coming up from the binding domain, uh, from the inner core, uh, to be able to provide the binding domain for uh, the molecules that are gonna decorate above that, right? And so essentially you're forming this shell of protein that's being tethered by these uh, interactions. And so there's three molecules of E1 that are essentially sitting right above uh, the E2 molecule. And so you, you, you have to think about the, the regulatory molecules. So the regulatory molecules on the outside or the regulatory molecules on the inside? And the answer is they're on the inside. They're in between. Kinases and phosphatases have to be inside this shell, okay, to be able to do the phosphorylation facing the, the, the core. I just think that's amazing. Um, so there these, guys, these, these guys, uh, I, I mean, I personally had interactions with Dr. Gilman, who was the fourth Nobel Prize winner uh, after Dr. Dysenhofer, who was the third Nobel Prize winner after uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Goldstein were the first and the second Nobel Prize winners. And Dr. Boitler was the fifth Nobel Prize winner and Dr. Sudoff was the sixth Nobel Prize winner as we count them at UT Southwestern. Our math is a little fuzzy math, <laughs> uh, but anyway. Uh, it was fantastic because I had the uh, opportunity to have Dr. Boiler come in and lecture to the first year students on the very first day of class. And it was fantastic because uh, he said, well, you know, uh, 25 years ago, I was sitting in the seat right where you're sitting. And this is the same lecture room that we were, we were in 25 years ago when I was a student here. I, I don't know if it was 25 years ago, but uh, at least um, it was some period of time. And he, of course, Dr. Boitler had been lured back to UT Southwestern after he had gone out to, to California. And uh, right before he got, uh, uh, right before he, uh, he arrived at, at UT Southwestern, but he'd already accepted the job, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And so that's really a, a coup uh, to, to be able to lure him away from California and, and give him a Nobel Prize. But he did all of his work here at UT Southwestern that, uh, that was uh, instrumental in innate immunity that he's now working on mice and, and trying to figure out uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, that was really cool. Dr. Gilman uh, has passed away, but Dr. Gilman uh, has studied G proteins and G protein couple receptors and was the previous chair and dean and maybe president 
of UT Southwestern for a period of time. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Gilman um, uh, actually was very fond of being chair of pharmacology and loved that job uh, to no end. And I remember as I was getting ready to uh, come on board as an assistant course director, I went and talked to him and he said, why in the world do you want to do this? <laughs> Medical students are cranky. They're just cranky. And um, uh, I'll never forget uh, sitting in his office and having a discussion with him. Um, hey, Max, uh, I've uh, had the opportunity to be on a panel with Dr. Boydler, which was one of the high points of my life. And then Dr. Mike Brown, I got to know <laughs> sitting in the bar in the faculty club, <laughs> which yeah. is a hangout for both of us. Yeah. And <laughs> I would bring uh, various pre-med students to come hang out with me. And uh, Dr. Uh, Brown would come sit with us and we'd have a drink and he would tell us this, his story. And, yeah. and finally, one day uh, at the end of the, our discussion, I said, Mike, is there anything that you would like to say to these pre-healthcare students in terms of giving them one word to guide them along the way? And Max, I swear to God, Mike Brown leaned forward, pointed at them, and he said, it's all about the patient. Of yeah. course, I was going, I was going, yes, yes. <laughs> is that great That's exactly what? what we say, right? Oh, yeah. Where's the patient-centric element, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a really funny thing that one of, uh, one of my lab assistants uh, answered the phone when Dr. Boiler called over to talk to me about his lecture. And so she said, there's somebody by the name of Bruce Butler that wants to talk to you. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 that's not him. But I'll go talk to him. And then we'll have a talk about who Dr. Dr. Boitler really is. <laughs> Hey, Ma hey, Max. When, when, when hey, I Max. told her who he was, she just, her face turned beet red. Oh, that's great. Hey, Max, we just had, we just had some, uh, one of the students on chat nominate you for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I assure you it's premature, uh, way premature. But this is Dr. Deisenhofer, and I just love Dr. Deisenhofer. Uh, he is my hero, and I, I just, I cannot say that. <laughs> good things about Dr. Deisenhofer, uh, mainly because of all of his work that led to uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, his Nobel Prize was related to the photosynthetic reaction center from bacteria uh, that I used to work with and I used to work on. And, uh, and subsequent to that, he came to UT Southwestern and saw the bazillion other different structures uh, because he was, a, he was a fantastic crystallographer. But the thing that, that really ties me to him is the fact that he solved the mammalian uh, ubiquinol cytochrome, cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which is the BC1, uh, cytochrome BC1 complex. And that is a complex that I worked on in bacteria. And so I always think, you know, that his was more complicated than the one I worked on in bacteria, but it did the same thing. And so I always thought, you know, that was the cool association with, uh, with Dr. Dysenhofer. These are two other friends of mine. Uh, one of them on the left side is Dr. Kosaka Ueda, and uh, the one on the right is Dr. Roddy P. Cox. Uh, these two gentlemen are both retired from UT Southwestern. Dr. Cox retired after 67 years of medical practice, okay? And uh, he is 95 years old, looks just like this picture on the bottom with his bow tie on, and uh, is doing just fine. And Dr. Ueda grew up in Japan. And Dr. Ueda came to the United States, was educated at UC Berkeley and discovered the carbohydrate responsive element binding um, transcription factor. And, and so I just think that it is amazing that UT Southwestern has had all of these famous guys that have contributed so notably to science. And two of those uh, two of those camps, one from the, the, the Brown and Goldstein complex uh, determining the sterol uh, responsive element binding protein uh, being a, a very critically important transcription factor, and Dr. Ueda discovering the carbohydrate uh, transcription factor that was analogous to the one that uh, Mike and Joe did uh, for the, the SREBP. I just think that's an amazing thing. And the thing I will leave you with is Dr. Ueda as a young boy out in the, in the very remote areas of Japan, said he would come home from school, would look up and would know what time it was because the American bombers were flying either to 
or from their bombing sites uh, as they were bombing places in Japan. And for some young man uh, that's going to school, that's trying to do the best he can to learn to stay out of harm's way and to end up getting to the United States, being state educated and being able to contribute to such significant levels uh, towards research. I think that if you have a dream, you can accomplish it uh, if you just uh, put your mind to it. And that's what he did. And, uh, and, and I think that's just amazing. Yeah, so anyway, I'll move on. So highlights, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, in a, a, a test for one of the MS1 students, one of my MS1 students that had a panic attack and he came out of the class uh, three times and said, I cannot take this first exam for biochemistry because I look at the paper and I see nothing that makes sense on the paper. And every time I go back in and look at it, it looks worse than it did the first time. And finally, on the third time out, I said, you're done. That's it. I don't want you to go back in there anymore. I pulled him out of the exam. And the next day I brought him back in, gave him the exam and he scored a 85 on the, on the exam. So he did okay. And he did okay in the class, but uh, it was just a kind of a rough start. Uh, PC1 honors for the best course uh, that I was a co-course director of. So I, I really um, um, am very proud of that. And serving on the MS um, Medical Student Admissions Committee with Dr. Fowler, um, I know of no greater honor than to do that job. And we take great pride in doing that. And we are gatekeepers uh, as best we can be and gate openers for the people that need to come in the door. Well, it's a privilege, it's a privilege Max. You know, it's our job to pick the next doctors, uh, the next ones to come along. Yeah. And it is a hell of a lot of work, and we don't get a dime for doing it. Right. And we don't get any buy down on our shifts. What we do get yeah. is the, I get to hang out with you for four hours in the <laughs> evening once, <Yeah. clears throat> once a week and have lunch occasionally. Right. But what we do get out of that is the knowledge about the fact that we, we have been part of directing the path of medicine. And that's a very important thing. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And these other things are just, you know, icing on the cake. Uh, but coming to work here every day has been a real treat. And um, uh, I will miss that when that stops. Um, I'm closer to that day now than I used to be. But um, it's been a fantastic journey. And every day has been a new adventure, I would say, uh, for the most part. And um, well worth coming to work for, yes. Max, how much, what percentage would you say, just small, medium, or large, that it is that the relationships you make there at the school and the people with whom you work plays in your job satisfaction? Oh, it's extremely, it's extremely, um, it's extremely critical and extremely high percentage. Um, I think, you know, that um, if I did not have um, all of those contacts, if I did not, did not have all of those connections, if I could not you know, trust all of the people that, that do all of the things across the campus over, um, I don't know, 45 different core laboratories, uh, and, and many of which I've actually worked in or actually gone to visit and taken samples to, uh, if we did not have that close-knit collaboration, <clears throat> and, and it has been a very collaborative, you can see, I mean, this is about half of the people that I would think, uh, uh, that I need to think, uh, for, uh, for all of the work that we've done together. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge, that's a huge part of it. Absolutely. So, so Max, I was so desirous, firstly, to, to let all these kids meet you because you're such a nice man. <laughs> <clears throat> One of my best friends. Um, Likewise. Well, I know. And, um, uh, but I also wanted them to see by the hundreds and it'll be the thousands that'll watch your talk that there are other paths than a direct clinical talk where you're going from patient to patient to patient. Right. right. How many lives could the work that you're doing there in your lab touch? Thousands, yeah. right. millions. Uh, uh, I, I think and when well, I'm having a drink, when I'm having a drink with Mike Brown, this is a guy yeah. that did the work that discovered the LD, LDL receptor that resulted right. in statin drugs yep. that have, pre exactly. have prevented millions of heart attacks. Oh yeah, absolutely. So and, 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 you're and I remember, you know, I remember him coming in 
And actually, Mike is still giving lectures to our PC1 students. Uh, so, you know, the first day of class, he comes in and says, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the number of heart uh, related fatalities have decreased, but this is why, you know, and, 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 and this drug actually made a big difference, you know, in their lives. And you know that it, it's, it's because of his work uh, with Joe Goldstein uh, that has, has contributed to that whole process. And, you know, they're um, uh, still doing science and still doing amazing parts of science. But, uh, you know, at some, I, uh, I was time, at some point in time, they will, they'll stop. And it'll be just a real loss. I was sitting in the club with Mike one day and I said, so uh, Mike, because he's, he's close to 80 now. I said, yeah, are, uh, are you ever going to retire or are you just going to be found stiff and cold in your office one day? Right. Yeah. And we both laughed about that. And then he said to me, he gave me, gave me a piece of advice. He said, Ray, never retire unless you have a compelling interest at home. Yeah. And I realized, Max, I don't really have a compelling interest at home. I, <laughs> I, I, I go to work for my interest. You know? That's that's right. That's right. Yep. So, so that's your last line. That's it. I'm done. Well, why don't we hit you with some questions? We only okay, have about on. a million, but let's ask you three or four. Uh, <laughs> Elena, you want to pull up your slides? Uh, yes. God, Max, that was a great talk. I, ho I wish you could have seen all the reviews from the students going there. That's why right. can't my bio <laughs> professor <clears throat> explain this the way he explained it? All right, uh, uh, Elena, give us three or four. Okay, uh, well, one of our comments that we have first, it, uh, I just wanna uh, say it out loud, but someone wrote, um, let me be honest, if I had a lecture even as close to this, being so patient and explaining, I would have aced all my modules. Sadly, my lectures were too concise to the point of us not even having a clear idea of what's going on. Thank you, Dr. Wynn. So <laughs> I just wanted to read that. <laughs> <laughs> Max, we had a bunch of takers for nominating you for the Nobel Prize. I, I want to <laughs> uh, go, go ahead, Elena. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and start with the questions. Sure. Uh, one question we have is, um, someone asked if they could become a doctor and work with patients, but switch to a lab setting for research later on. If yes, do, I, do they need to change to a chem degree? No, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, that wouldn't be, uh, I don't think that would be uh, first choice. You know, Dr. Gilman would say that, you know, he had an MD degree and uh, never practiced medicine on a patient, I guess, after he finished. Well, I don't even know if he did residency. I don't even think that uh, Al Gilman did a residency. I think he went directly from medical school to a lab and started working in a lab and never looked back. Okay. Uh, but I understand the, the desire to actually treat patients and, and to work in the laboratory as well. I think you just need to get into a laboratory setting where you feel very comfortable. You feel um, like you can make a contribution. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much, I think, uh, in terms of what your background is um, and uh, what your major is. It's just that having this passion to serve mankind to serve your patients uh, in the best possible way you can with either treating them or with coming up with therapies to be able to treat them uh, that matters. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then another question we have is, <coughs> how did you tie this PhD research into your medical school admissions process? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think you volunteered. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Pretty much, pretty much I volunteered, uh, to do that, but I saw, I saw the necessity for being able to help with that process. Uh, it was a privilege to me, uh, that, um, one of my students, former students, his name was Michael. He's an orthopedic surgeon here on campus. And he scored three 100s, three perfect scores out of the four biochemistry exams that we gave him. He was the Hoten Award winner, went out to UCLA to get a residency in orthopedic surgery and came back to UT Southwestern. I ran into him in the hall. I knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly who I was. And I said, wow, what are you doing here at UT Southwestern? He said, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And I thought, man. <laughs> 
you are awesome and you're still awesome. And, and that's, the, that's the whole process that I like to see play out uh, with our students. And if I could play a part of that, then. That's... Well, and, and you mentioned the students won't know the Ho Den Award is for the top medical student in the oh. class. And so Dr. Wynn here mentored an individual who went on to be number one in the class and then went off to his further training. So, yeah. you know, you don't get that connection very often, Max, you know, it's very special when it happens. That's, that's just amazing. It's just amazing. He's just an amazing guy. And, and I really am privileged to know him. Yes. Let's do about two more, uh, Elena. And Max, we've got, God, 50 questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll spare you. Okay. Nope. That's fine. Uh, we do have a good question, Lane. I'll just blood in. What's a typical day like for you as a researcher, Max, and your work-life balance? Uh, well, I usually uh, am here uh, before eight o'clock every morning uh, because you know I, I live uh, uh, on a route that I can get onto the train, so I don't have to drive and, and spend all the time driving. So I can work on the train, uh, doing stuff, uh, reading uh, articles, reading computer things, working on papers, working on grants, uh, and then. Uh, I get here and, and start doing experiments and, and just don't stop until, you know, it's time to go home. Um, and, and that's, that's just been my life for, for a lot of, a lot of years, uh, that I've been here at Southwestern. And so, um, you know, there, there's some days where I'm not in the lab as much, but I still do a lot of bench work myself. Uh, I have learned, uh, some new, uh, techniques over the last two or three years and, uh, use those, um, and help researchers uh, in one of the core labs that I help run experiments in. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a process of, of being collaborative and and uh, and doing. You were things. you were married in undergrad school, Max. I was married right after right, my wife and I. Sharon uh, was my wife. She uh, is uh, she was actually probably a better chemistry student than I was. When she, <laughs> when she and she was actually a chemistry major for a short period of time, and then she decided she didn't want to be a chemistry major. She wanted to be a math major. I don't know why she did that, but she's uh, she's uh, ended up being an educator, uh, was a, 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 a elementary school principal, and so oh my. Uh, she and I got married after college. I promised her dad that we would we would stay uh, unmarried until we got out of college, and we did. And then uh, I uh, drug her around to various places like UC Berkeley, and then uh, back to Dallas. But anyway, she hasn't complained too much about being back in you. Dallas. No. You have children. You have children. How I have one child. One child. One grandchild. Yeah, and my my daughter is a, a professor, a genetics professor in uh, Virginia, and her husband is a chemist. <laughs> so I don't think I had anything to do with that, but it just happened. Yeah. Uh, and Max, uh, uh, Elena, I'll just pose it. Uh, last question: What are today's yeah. prospects for getting a sustainable career for PhD graduates? Academia, government, industry. Could you comment? Uh, I think they're really, really good because I think the biotech field is just exploding. Uh, you know, there was a time where like um, Watson, you know, the Watson and Crick uh, came out to UC, UC uh, San Francisco. And this was back when the human, just before the human genome started, kicked off right before the millennium. And uh, he made a bunch of people mad because what he was doing was he was trying to affect um, students uh, willingness to work in certain areas and policy. And so he was being a politician uh, for science. And he said, if you're not working on the human genome project in five years, you'll be without a job. And man, that just really was a wrong thing for him to say. Uh, of course, he didn't care uh, because you know he's uh, one of those lightning rod guys anyway. Uh, he doesn't mind uh, stirring up trouble. Um, and it probably did catapult a lot of people to go and work on the Human Genome Project. Uh, but I think um, uh, that sort of thing is a pretty rare thing that happens. Uh, but certainly with the biotech fields, uh, with all of the, the human uh, genome stuff, with all of the gene therapy things that are out there, uh, potential uh, therapeutics, uh, there's just a, a huge number of companies that I think give people that have PhDs uh, a lot of different choices than I would have had, uh, you know, if it were me uh, back, you know, uh, 40 years ago. Yeah. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, Elena, do you want to give them last little instructions to the students about the uh, exam for tonight? Uh, yes. So our quiz will be due at 6.59 Central Standard Time uh, next week. 
uh, which is session 92 quiz. And they will receive, receive a link for, you may have just said this, they, they'll receive a link for one of the prior lectures also for an exam, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Oh, oh, there it is, it's in chat. Folks, section 16, we're gonna run again. Uh, and if you will just leave the chat alone right there for a moment, folks. Um, and uh, everybody grab that uh, link. Dr. Wynn, thank you, Elena, is that all you have? Uh, yes, that's all I have. Okay, uh, Max, I, I can't thank you enough. What a wonderful talk you gave tonight. I want everybody listening, all 300 of you put thank you into chat. And those are all for you, Max. <clears throat> so just glance at the chat for a second and watch all these kids from all over the world. Thank you for your kindness and your sweet yeah. demeanor, your amazing yeah. skill. Yeah. You guys are fantastic. I love you all. Max, we're gonna we're gonna post this online, and yeah. probably right. five thousand kids will watch this talk. <laughs> Each one of them a future healthcare provider. Absolutely. <clears throat> Each one of them will go on to see probably a hundred thousand patients in a career. Five thousand times a hundred thousand is a half a billion. Max, tonight you will have touched a half a billion lives, a fair percentage of the population of the planet, with your grace and your humor and your incredible skills. So we're just all exceptionally grateful uh, and just thank you so very, very much for joining us tonight. And uh, okay. it made a real impact on our students tonight. Thank you. Um, to all of you that came, thank you for coming. Another wonderful session in virtual shadowing. We've got a couple of great sessions coming up for you uh, soon. We're going to give you spring break, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of March. We'll let you take a break for a little bit and we'll, we'll be back rocking and rolling uh, in April. So on behalf of our wonderful Dr. Wynn, on behalf of the whole virtual shadowing working group who week after week put this thing together for you, we just want to thank you so much for coming. If you keep coming, we're going to keep coming. And um, we will see you next week. And so on behalf of the whole team, we wish you a good evening and a good night.